uh, or they get, uh, you, they, the psychiatrist, psychologist kind of fudges and says, well, they almost have this illness or they almost have that illness, and they try to treat them for something like that, and that doesn't work either. So um, these people just kind of roam around aimlessly from place to place. I had one individual was put into kind of classic anger management, you know, where you sit around in a circle and you kind of discuss stressful events in your life. He attacked another guy in the, in the circle physically. We got agitated. They don't do well in those situations. Uh, they don't really introspect really well. And that's going to be ultimately the point here, and that is as far as psychology, psychiatry, counseling, and you know, mental health healers, these people tend to be discarded because you don't want them walking in your office because they're violent. They hurt people, and you don't want to be responsible because, particularly with ones that say, I don't have any control over what I do. Um, so it's not like they're sitting around thinking about hurting people. It's just that I get agitated and I lose it. And so, uh, you know, this is not somebody you want to be dealing with traditionally. And, and the traditional therapies have really, you know, they've been looked at as really poor therapy candidates. Uh, you know, and they don't introspect well and things like that. I have a really good psychiatry friend I work with, and she's one of the best psychiatrists I've ever worked with, but she just told me flat out, I don't ever want you to send me one of these people. I don't want them in my practice. They're just too difficult to deal with. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. So, uh, and now we're going to talk about that a little bit. Well, let me just give you a real brief kind of profile, and I'm not going to get into the, all the biology here, but there is, these people clearly show some biological abnormalities. Uh, they have a pretty messed up personality profile, that a lot of what's called irritable impulsiveness. They're impulsive, they're angry, hostile, they have a lot of neuroticism. They're, they're agitated all the time. Neuropsychologically, they show a lot of executive function uh, problems, particularly with impulse control and planning and strategic processing. They can't form strategies. And then uh, finally, they, when you do physiology on them, EEGs, evoke potentials, you find that they have a broad cognitive deficit. They just don't process information well. They don't make decisions appropriately. Uh, their brain just does not function efficiently is probably the best way to say it. Now, having said that, and that's my background. My background is from a biological, me classic medical model. So I set out, I'm going to fix all these people, okay, and, I, and the, what's the best way to fix somebody, of course, when you have a degree in neuroscience, and that's with a pill. So I, that's what I do. I do clinical drug trials, and um, we do drug trials with anticonvulsants because we found them to be very effective. Um, the only problem with that is I'm going to show you that, that we get tremendous placebo effects, which I'm going to suggest to you in a few moments means that psychology and psychiatry have really failed these people because that means that they are good therapy candidates, but we just don't do the therapy right on them because we don't, we don't focus it right. Well, those people, both ADD and fetal alcohol syndrome, conduct disorder, a lot of those illnesses, they can clearly show aggression, and it can be impulsive in nature. These people here do not have a definable axis one disorder. They may have a personality disorder at most, but all the people I have here that I'll show you, they have no major mental illness. They, they're just aggressive. Some of, them, some of them have, but they don't meet any criteria for post-traumatic stress. They're all weeded out for Axis ones. But some have had and plenty have not. I would say less than half have had any kind of definable trauma that they remember. So, I mean, yeah, we, um, those clearly exist, and you can clearly get aggression out of early life trauma. Um, and we have done some PTSD stuff, but... Uh, these guys are very clean, and that's, that's why they're kind, of an, they're kind of a mystery to psychology. Is, and, and I have more than I know what to do with. They come out of the woodwork. They're just kind of moved around. Go over there now, go over there now. Now, kind of a model of impulsive aggression that had been put forth by, say, Emil Kakara uh, or Ernie Barrett was, was kind of this idea. And that is that, that you have some kind of, kind of neural activation 
for behavior. There's some cognitive process, you know, since I'm a neuroscientist, we can't really talk about cognition, but you know, something fires off in your head that you're going to actually perform some behavior, and that probably that will then filter through some kind of control system that's going to decide is that appropriate or not. You know, and again, these are using those kind of terms is way outside the idea of neuroscience because we want to just talk about you know, neural aspects, and then you get some behavior. But what Emil Kukera and Ernie Barrett and people like that have suggested is, what if the activation is all anger and hostility? So that's the person has this hostile attribution bias. They have a lot of irritability. They're agitated. That's how they live their life. And then the control system is just out of whack, which is what I, in essence, just showed you with all the neuropsychological and biological problems we find in them. Their brains doesn't work as well, particularly their executive function or frontal uh, areas don't work as well. And we can show that. So when we have this kind of scenario, what you get is aggressive behavior because they become agitated at virtually anything because they have this hostile attribution bias. Whenever you come near them or speak to them or anything happens, it's a threat. And we see that in, in our, their processing. They process virtually every stimulus as if it's novel. And so that's why one day they'll go off at one thing, and the next day they won't. You know, the example I gave yesterday was a gentleman, uh, one of the patients I had when I was in Galveston, he came, uh, came home and his wife didn't have dinner ready. And that ended in a six-hour siege with the SWAT team. After he beat the hell out of her, burned all her clothes, destroyed the inside of the house, and then the police showed up, and that's when he barricaded himself in the house because he realized... At that point, he was coming down off of the explosiveness. And uh, so, you know, when I interviewed him, he was in the study, and I asked him, he, he had lots of impulsive outbursts. What happened? Why did you do that? She should have had dinner ready. I mean, he said that just as a matter of fact. As, and in his mind, he knew that wasn't, that it didn't warrant that kind of response, but that was the trigger to him, was that, yeah, good. Did she never have? She always had dinner ready every time you ever came home. Oh, sure, she didn't have dinner plenty of times. I just had a bad day at work that day. So it, it, you know, he he kind of, and you know, he didn't remember the event well. He he saw it as kind of separate from himself. And it's not that he doesn't take responsibility for it because they do feel that obviously there ultimately there's some responsibility there. It's just they see it very separate from themselves. And that's a pretty major event. You know, this, that would be a major event in a lifelong history of just blowing up at people at the supermarket or someone bumping into you in a bar and you're getting in a fight or things like that. Well, having said all that, uh, you know, I'm talking about an agitated state and I'm talking about all these types of things, but do these people really, do they really lose control? I guess that's the question. Because if they don't really lose control, then their perception of their illness is just what's, is what the problem is, perhaps. So what we've done, this is some data, a couple of different scales. This is an aggression propagation scale. And what it does is it presents a set of vignettes to the person that they have to then decide what would be their response in that situation. So you know they're not agitated. They're sitting in my lab, very relaxed, very calm, drinking a Coke, doing whatever. And we're there with them, and we're helping them work through this. And they're asked to read several vignettes of incidences that happen. And uh, then they're so, in this instance, in the provocation scale, they have to rate how upset they would be by that. And then they have to decide from one of five different options on what they would do in that situation. One is an option that it means they would avoid the person or whatever happened completely. They just walk away. One is that they would uh, consider it no problem and would continue in the interaction. Uh, one is, uh, means that they're very angry about the, what happened, but they wouldn't do anything about it. One is a socially acceptable response, and one is a socially unacceptable, which typically is a violent response. So to give you an example of a vignette, this is called the car story. Uh, you're late for work, and right in front of you, a car stops. A man gets out, but continues to talk to the driver. So you can picture the scenario. He's dropping someone off. Someone gets out. You know, and this has all happened to all of us. They're blocking traffic. Uh, you cannot get past the car, and he is blatantly ignoring your calls for him to move. Okay, so then they're given a set of five options. And what do you think you do in this situation? Get out of your car, walk over to the man, and threaten him. 
reverse the car and take another route, sit in the car and fume with anger but do nothing, calmly wait until he moves, go over to him and tell him that he is being unreasonable and ask him to move. All of these vignettes were actually generated out of actual incidences that had happened during, from people that we've seen over the past. But normally what happens is a guy gets out and he beats the crud out of the guy. Okay, and that's happened more than one time. I had a guy get in a fight with a guy on a bicycle on the way to the lab to get his medication. You know, because he thought the guy had, you know, done an obscene gesture at him, which the guy didn't even know who he was. But if you look at this, remember, they're not agitated. This is not a real event. They're calm. These are control subjects, non-aggressive individuals, match for age and IQ, education. These are our impulsive aggressors. Um, the, not, the controls are more likely to a, a choose an avoidance, you know, where they would just, that was when you back off and just go another way in that instance, or that it's no problem, they would just sit there and wait. Um, angry, but not do anything, they're about the same, but look, socially unacceptable, it's, it was close to significance, but it wasn't, this is a pretty small sample, and it's socially unacceptable. They're much, the, the pulse of aggression is much more likely to choose so, the one where you get out and you go fight the guy. But when they describe their aggression, it always stems from an agitated state in which they lose control of themselves but they're fully in control of themselves. Now, that, you may go, oh, okay, well, maybe they are confused and they're just telling you what they, what they think they would normally do because of who they are. Well, okay, well, we thought about that too, so we thought about, well, maybe they don't appreciate the consequences of what they do. You know, maybe when they, you know, they don't really appreciate, they just have lived their life this way and they don't really understand the consequences. This is the consequence of aggression scale, which again, presents a set of vignettes and then the person has to determine the consequences of what would happen if they indeed acted inappropriately in a violent manner. Okay? Like for instance, this one, this is called the bar story. While you're at a bar with some friends, a stranger walks by you and bumps hard into your shoulder. Your first thought is to grab his shirt and demand an apology. Okay? If you did grab his shirt, then we ask, do you think that he would do it again? and they have to answer that. Do you think you would get in trouble? And there's a set of, you know, what might happen. Do you think you would feel bad after that you grabbed his shirt? Do you think he deserved it? And do you think that uh, it would be wrong for you to do that? Now, in every instance here, what their response is is always wrong. It's always an aggressive response that would be inappropriate. Now, the higher numbers are the worst numbers. Okay, you don't want to be high. So what you find is they both agree pretty much on that the person would probably not do it again if they grabbed them, you know, um, in this sense. You know, there's a lot of vignettes here. They also are, are pretty similar on, on the level if they would get in trouble or not, the, both controls and aggressors. But do they feel bad? Well, the higher the number, the less bad you feel. They don't feel bad that they did it. Uh, do, you think they de do you think they deserved it? The higher number means, yeah, the more you think they deserved it. And this was, this was like .06 right here as far as significance goes. Do you think it was wrong? The higher the number, the less wrong you think it is. So they're more likely to choose a socially unacceptable response. They're more likely to not feel bad about it. They're more likely to feel the person deserves it, which if you can get into a discussion of that, that totally loses the context of losing control. In that sense, now you're paying them back for what they've done to you. That's very planned, very conscious. And then they also don't really feel like it's wrong, what they're doing. They're really kind of owning what they do. It's an appropriate response. Now, having said all that, you know, we get back to this idea of, you know, I'm a different person. I'm Jekyll and Hyde. You know, I'm losing. You know, when, when Dr. Jekyll is Mr. Hyde in the book, he truly is separate from his, his person of Hyde, at least the way it's described until the end. Here, while it's described that way, our data is starting to suggest that they're not really separate. They, they do understand what they do. What, what I would suggest at this point is the level of violence is what they lose control of, not the violence. Does that make sense? The violence is an option, but the level of the violence is what they may lose. It scares them how far they go. Uh, an example of that would have been uh, uh, when we did one of our prison studies, 
a uh, really nice young man, about 24 years old. Um, he was in for some burglary or something. But in the prison, uh, in this prison we were working at, they worked in the fields. They, they ran a farm. That was how this prison did. And uh, a guy bumped into him from a rival gang. It was an accident. He knew that it was an accident. He attacked the guy in the field, guards in full sight, uh, began fighting with him, and ultimately got him on the ground and had taken a, gotten a large rock and was going to bash his head in. He had gone so far beyond the provocation that his own gang members pulled him off the guy to save the guy. Because a person that they hate, they saved, because they were even frightened by his level of aggressiveness. Now, when he describes that, he says, I totally lost control. But if you were to look at his scores on this, you know, when you ask him about that particular incident, you focus on this, of course he didn't feel bad. That was a rival gang member. And of course he deserved it. He probably bumped into me. It might have been asked, but maybe it wasn't. And of course I wasn't wrong in doing that. That probably gained him some social status within his, but he lost control of the level of violence. Now, having said all that, let's turn to the placebo, and I'll try to pull this all back together. And this is kind of a you know, 1978 definition of placebo. But placebo, to me, when I was in graduate school, which wasn't all that many years ago, 10 years ago, that was a bad thing. Okay, placebo, you don't want to have a placebo effect. You want to have a small placebo effect because that's how you're going to assess drug efficacy. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But to define a therapy component, we, we pretty much all just know this. You know, we're looking for some nonspecific psychological or psychophysiological effect. You don't want it to have an effect. That's why you give people dextrose. You know, and then for a long time, there was an argument that you should give an active placebo, something that has side effects to make the person think they're on something. And now the tide has turned even completely the other way. Now people are focusing on the placebo within the, like I said uh, yesterday in the discussion we were having in the hospitality room is in the, within this short period of time of this year, there's already been two major articles in the American Journal of Psychiatry on treating depression, major clinical depression with placebos, getting significant fMRI changes and significant uh, recovery. And they're actually suggesting now that 50 to 75% of antidepressant medication efficacy is placebo in effect and that antidepressants may be on their way out. There's an American Journal of Psychiatry, two major federally funded, U.S. federal funded studies. Um, and uh, I know of a foundation that's just been set up in Chicago, Mind Body Foundation, huge endowment. This is their interest, is placebo effects. They're, they're, they've said for the first X number of years they're funding placebo and they've already given uh, Cassiopa, who's one of the most renowned psychophysiologists in the world, their first major grant to assess placebo effects. So, you know, I think you may see where some of this might be coming. And then the placebo effect is obvious. It's defined as a psychological or psychophysiological effect produced by placebos. So now let me, let me just step back one and say this. When you do a drug trial, if you have any hope of ever getting that drug recommended for the use that you want it, what you have to do is have to have a placebo group a group that takes something inert and then doesn't have as good of an effect as the group that takes some active substance, okay? Now, no one would ever argue with you that placebos have some psychological effect. They clearly do and they always have, okay? I mean, that, that's an age-old concept. Um, but it's always been thought of kind of as a negative or kind of a throwaway. Um, we're not interested in that. We're only listen, interested in the, psycho, in the physiological effect of the active substance. We want to, the psychological, it's kind of a, that's a lesser effect. We don't want to worry about that. And that probably has been because placebo effects cannot be maintained over a long period of time. Because what happens is the person loses their, ex, their expectancy of healing. They realize that they're not getting any better and the placebo effect starts to go away. Um, you know, if I just bring, I mean, you come in here and I give you some dextrose and I go, here, take this as a placebo, it's not going to do anything to you. You don't get a placebo effect. There has to be some expectancy of health or healing or change. So having said that, most of the studies that are done, if they do not have a significant effect or statistically significant effect beyond the placebo, the drug's just discarded. It's looked at as not effective. Um, and in aggression work, the, you know, there hasn't been all that many 
classic clinical trials done, but many have been abandoned completely because placebo effects were very, very large. Now, you don't know about that because you don't publish that stuff. I mean, no one until recently would publish your placebo effects. They would say, well, your study didn't work. I mean, I know for a fact in 1984, an enormous 500 subject study was done with lithium and one other medication on intermittent explosive disorder. I mean, do you know how long it would take you to find 500 people with intermittent explosive disorder? Probably a lifetime. It, it was unbelievable. It was a huge NIMH study. It was completely abandoned because the placebo effect was 57%. Okay? The placebo was better than the medication. Okay? They got better on the placebo. And they abandoned it. Never published anything. Never did a presentation. Nobody even knows about it. The only reason I know about it is because my postdoc mentor was one of the major people in the study. Okay? Now, they attributed that to poor sampling. Okay? And they missed the boat. They totally missed the boat. And this is why they missed the boat. These are four studies that I've been involved in myself. And I use these. There are others but because they all used anticonvulsant medications and they all used exactly the same classification scheme for impulsive aggression, so they're pretty consistent. There are other studies that you could see the same thing in. But these are the placebo effects. And when I say placebo effect, I said this is the percentage of reduction in outburst that you saw after, say, six to eight weeks, depending on the study, of treatment with placebo. 35% reduction. If, I, if you walked in my office and you're violent and I told you that I could reduce your aggressive outburst 35%, would that be significant to you? Or even 21%. These are both done in prison inmates, these in outpatients that are just community sample people. 33%. And in the study we're doing right now, which is parallel group design, and we have three different uh, anticonvulsants, 47% so far reduction, a 47, almost a 50% reduction in the frequency of explosive outbursts. Now, there was a moment in my office that I said, well, my career is done. That's, this isn't working, okay? Now, granted, I can tell you that the drugs will reduce the aggression 60 to 70%. But when you're getting a 47% placebo, even when you got a 60% reduction, even if that's statistically significant, it has to say something to you to, to realize that for, if I just gave them sugar, they're getting 47% reduction. What does that mean? What, is this, what does that mean in the context of the fact that they really do have an understanding of what's going on with them? And that's where I get back to the idea of expectancy. They have been told over and over that they are bad and that there's some part of them that they can't control and that no one can do anything about. So here they come to us and we say, you know what, 60 to 70 percent of the people that are in this study, which right now it's closer to 70, have had significant reduction in their outburst. And they go, I finally found somebody that can help me. Now, you have to realize that they say that it's, it's another part of them, a separate part that's aggressive, but they're the one that has to get the treatment, obviously. Again, we're getting back to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He had to do something to himself. And so now I'm telling, you know, my students are telling them they're coming in every two weeks as part of the study. We're telling them, oh, you know, you've got to stay in the study. It's going to be great. They're getting rewarded for being in the study. Their wife is nicer to them or their boss or whoever, okay? Now, that's expectancy. I expect, I anticipate to get better. This guy who's got these three letters after his name, and knows a lot more than I do about my brain, told me I'm going to get better. So I'm going to get better. And they get better. This is an eight-week study we're doing. Here's, here's week two. This may, after the first two weeks they've been on, uh, everybody goes on the placebo. Okay? Everybody's on the placebo for the first two weeks. It's a baseline to find out how aggressive they really are. They don't know what they're on. They never know. And, and none of, we don't know, at these points, what they're on, it's double blind. I mean, I know, but I don't see them at these points. But everybody knows, all my students know they're on the placebo the first two weeks. It's single blind, but then it goes double blind. And you can see that the placebo group and the, these are anticonvulsants. These are all three of those anticonvulsants combined into one group. 
they have about the same number of outbursts. This is mean impulsive aggressive outburst in two weeks. They have a little bit over four outbursts on average over two weeks. And that's a physically aggressive outburst. They attack somebody or they broke things up. Okay? So that's nice and consistent. We'll look at week four. Now they've been on either a placebo for two weeks or on um, an anticonvulsant for two weeks. They both drop off. I mean, that's a significant change from baseline. I can, I'll tell you that. I, I have this marked for the difference between these two, but this is a significant reduction from baseline for both, for the placebo and the anticonvulsant. But look what happens. They start realizing that they're not getting any better because they keep having the outburst. And you, you see that in their self-reports when they come in. I know I'm on the placebo. I had an outburst last week. I don't feel any better. I'm just as angry as I've ever been. And this is the classic placebo effect. It's initial and then it can't be maintained because as the expectancy goes away, as they realize that they are not getting any better, they start to kind of go back to where they were. But look at the drug. It just gets better and better until finally at week eight, there's enormous difference between. But when you clump all this together and you analyze this data, guess what it looks like? It looks about like that. Here's the placebo effect and here's the drug effect. But wouldn't you say that there's clearly a drug effect and the placebo is only initial and then it begins to go away? So the way we've tended to analyze our drug data has really been a kind of a miscon. And I think that that's really hurt not just aggressive patients, but all patients. Because what you're getting is a clear combination of a psychological and a, and a physiological effect. The, and here it continues on because the person's getting rewarded. I feel better. I'm not acting bad. People are interacting with me. My wife is being nice to me. My boss said I did a good job last week. So you could get the continued interaction. Here you're losing the psychological effect because they're not, their expectancy is gone. Now having said that, you know, to imagine that after my training, I would ever stand here and talk about expectancy because what I'm talking about in essence is your mind. I'm talking about a mind-body phenomenon. I'm talking mind and body right here, and I'm talking there's no body. So it's still, it was messed up to begin with, and now you're losing the concept that you could possibly get better. Now having said that, what does that say about the way we treat them? Because like I said, I can find very few therapists that want to sit down with antisocial personality disorder violent patients. I mean, you know, that's a nightmare. Or borderlines. You know, they're, they're not the person that you want to see come in the door because first off, the success rate is pretty low. And, you know, it, it's long term, okay? You, you don't get a lot of insight from a guy who has antisocial personality disorder a lot of times. There's not a lot of usefulness to do, you know, we recommend mainly cognitive behavior therapy, but a lot of people won't see them. But what does that say about them if we're getting these big placebo effects? Now look at their mood states. This, those were aggressive outbursts. This is how they feel. Tension, anxiety, depression, dejection, anger, hostility. And this is just dilant. This isn't all the anticonvulsants. I don't, I don't have all the data on the other two anticonvulsants on this yet, but yellow's baseline, placebo, and dilantin, and these, each of these is, is six weeks of treatment. And you see that there's a, there's a big placebo effect for tension anxiety, a significant one for depression, and, a, and a, one for anger hostility. Now, these two aren't significant, but what's interesting about this is, while this dilantin difference here, and here, and well, actually here and here, these two, tension, anxiety, anger, hostility, is different from the baseline. It's not different from the placebo. The placebo doesn't differ from either one. So that's called considered a non-placebo controlled result and not worthy of publication. Because I got, even though I got an effect beyond the placebo, it's not significant from the placebo. But what if we turn that around and we said, wow, look at that huge effect on the placebo. In fact, look, they're, they're significantly less depressed on the placebo. Okay, most of these guys, somebody had tried to convince them they were aggressive because they were depressed. But they're depressed because they're aggressive. And people won't talk to them. And people won't have anything to do with them. So, and we can see that right here by just being in the study and taking a pill three times a day with sugar in it, dextrose, they feel better. They're not as depressed. They're not as angry. They're not as tense. So they act better and they feel better. 
But again, this is short-lived. It starts to go away again also. Initial, first couple weeks, starts to fade away. The drug effect is maintained. There's some nice mood elevating effect to some of these anticonvulsants. So, let's kind of put all that in context. First, we talked about behavioral control and ultimately their responsibility. This idea that there's somebody else I'm losing. I don't have control over my behavior. And think about that. In our criminal cases, we do that. If somebody commits a passion crime, a passion kill, they didn't plan it, they lost control, and they killed somebody, versus I planned it out and I killed you, we punish those people very differently. And we look at it that way. And, and perhaps we should. But we're here, this person is saying, well, you know, I'm losing control. And so we just kind of push that away to some biological phenomenon. Or the mind, or the kind of conscious aspect, the, the idea that they, an expectancy of health would begin to transform them is not thought of. These people are bad therapy cases. Give them a pill. If it doesn't work, they're, they're done. Um, and ultimately, it does suggest that they have some responsibility, which I think is another thing that we don't try to demonstrate to them is that they are, it is ultimately them that is behaving this way. They're just defining themselves by the way they, by the way they interact with outside, not by what is inside and how they see themselves. Their identity is their behavior, not the thoughts that are going on or who they are inside, which is what you kind of see when you ask them these vignettes. Well, tell me what you would do here. Okay, well, what I would do is this is how I act. You know, do you see what I'm saying? As opposed to, but that's not me, which is what they would then say. And so that we get into those types of things, which are much more run the line of, of very kind of, you know, for me, way out on the edge of psychoanalysis and philosophy almost, as opposed to, you know, what neurotransmitter is that, which is what, you know, my major professor would want to know, so, and be laughing at, he would have walked out by now. The, uh, actually he wouldn't, because he has a lot of Native American in him, and he actually has a lot of this aspect in him, and then he was always trying to push that into me, and I was like, you are crazy, so uh, it's going to be drugs. Now, drug efficacy, now this is beyond the person. This basically says, and these things that we've been seeing published over the last year, and this funding that we've seen come available, it suggested that the way we test drugs is totally wrong. And the way that you are, in, it, it insisted, that they insist you publish them in, certain, in a certain way, does not demonstrate their efficacy. You, you're set up to fail. It, it, um, so, I mean, I won't belabor that point, but we simply need to change the way we analyze our data for drugs. Because if I tried to demonstrate, well, I got this great placebo effect at first, and then it goes away, but that still means the drug works, most journals aren't going to look at that. They're going to say, well, this is all confounded. It's a mess. And so, so I, I think that's a real problem, because things are disappearing that might be useful for a patient. Um, the ethics of treating someone with a placebo, particularly someone who's violent, you know that you're giving them something that is not active, quote unquote, and you are anticipating because of the expectancy and the kind of self-focus that you're bringing on them that they'll get better. Um, what if they don't and they hurt somebody and they come back to you and they say, what you were giving them dextrose or you weren't even, you weren't even treating them and you knew they were violent just like I think it'd be the same ethics of treating a depressed patient that you know these studies that were just done I'm the head of the human subjects committee at my university we have to do all the review of all proposals my question to them would have been you're going to treat them with with placebos and not tell them obviously you can't tell them what if they kill themselves are you responsible because the literature says that if you treat them, they're less likely to injure themselves than if you don't treat them. What are you going to do? Who's responsible for that? So there's a real ethical question there. That doesn't diminish the efficacy of the placebo. It just means that we need to think about it in a different way. We need to see the placebo as an effective and active treatment in certain situations. The only problem is, is as we realize that and everybody starts to understand that, 
you won't be able to treat anyone with placebos anymore because they'll know that you're giving them a placebo. So, you know, you can't say, you know, go to the pharmacist and pick up, you know, placebo, placebin, which would be the, you know, that's what I'll sell it as, placebin. You know, take 25 milligrams of placebin a day and you'll get better. Because, you know, once they realize, it's just not going to happen. And then finally, what kind of therapeutic options does that suggest? Because as I told you before, these people are notoriously bad therapy candidates. And I don't think that's because they're bad therapy. I think that's because of two things. We kind of put on them that they're a bad therapy candidate because we don't want them to be there. We transfer that onto them. And then secondly, um, the therapy is wrongly focused. Okay, We try to take a person who feels they have no control over their behavior and tell them, well, what you need to do is, in this situation, stop, step back. But I don't have any, this is not me that's doing this. This is what they're describing. This is Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, this is who I am. And so uh, they're not going to be able to do that. That's why, you know, one of the things that, that we describe to them is that the medication that we give them, it gives them the opportunity to decide on what they're going to do. That's exactly how we describe it to them. This will give you the moment you need to deal with the, to understand the consequences of what you're going to do. You'll be just as angry. All of that will still be there because anger is normal. But you'll give you an opportunity to make this. And that, the description there, that takes into account a psychological and a physiological aspect of the medication. So, having said that, and this is the one funny little therapy cartoon I once found. I said I have trouble developing close relationships with people for crying out. Clean out your ears, fathead. That's me sitting back there. That's, my, that's every patient I've ever seen right there. So there, we, we have transferred onto them that they're just atrocious therapy candidates. And I think the prop, that, that's just not true. I think, and what we recommend mainly is cognitive behavior therapy. But if you look at the literature, for instance, if you look at inside-oriented therapy, psychotherapy, there is some literature on borderline patients, you know, some effective some studies are actually done. There, there isn't a lot of literature because this is all focused a lot of times on case studies and small samples and stuff like that. So it's really hard to tell. And another thing is, is it's, it's also a little uh, disconcerting to imagine they're going to have a lot of insight when they've already, in essence, convinced themselves that it's, they're completely uncontrolled. It's like a separate part of them. But cognitive behavior therapy has been very effective with impulsive populations. There's a number of studies on impulsive children, substance abuse, borderline. You have dialectic uh, behavior therapy now. There's a lot of them. And so we've re you know, what we've recommended with our patients, and we've maintained most of it, a number of them are as far as five years out now, is a combination of the anticonvulsant and the cognitive behavior therapy. Now, what's interesting, that's the high sign that I asked for. What's interesting is the ones who, I mean, it's their option whether they go get the therapy. You know, I, I can I refer them out to a physician for the medication to maintain them after they've left us, and then we refer them to somebody for the therapy. Most of them will just go for the meds first, but a vast majority of them will call me back about a year later and say, "All right, what was the name of that guy you wanted me to go see for the therapy?" Because I'm better, but I'm still having them, and I don't want to have them at all. So even they realize at a point that there's two aspects to this. There's a physiological response, because they do have some biological abnormality. We can see that, the control issue. And then there's a psychological aspect. It's a, it's a turning back and, in essence, taking responsibility. It's that expectancy that I can get better and I can be in control of what I do, that I'm not going to be defined by the behavior. And so I think that that's what our placebo results are showing us. and that is bordering on a very scary area for me because that's not my training. And so, and we don't have a, I'm not really equipped to deal with that. So we're trying to add in more on that. We're trying to look at this a little bit more. And what does this mean in the greater scheme? Does it matter what I exactly say to them? If I didn't say that phrase I just said to you about, this is going to give you that, you know, that little moment to think, would that mean our results would be different? You know, the thing is, they watch for side effects, and they want to have side effects, because then they know they're on it. Uh, that's why the placebo guys make up side effects. You know, oh, I'm all dizzy all the time, and 
you know, in my head I'm thinking, man, you're taking sugar. You're not, there's nothing making you dizzy. You're just, you want to be dizzy. So, but it's the expectancy that's important. And I think that makes them good candidates for some of these therapies that we have tended to just kind of push them away from. So I'll stop there right at 50. And I ask if you have any questions. I'm a little bit out of my element, like I know, but I'm being stretched. And I'm... In the drug studies, they're men. Uh, we do see women for the baseline assessments. Like the information I, I presented yesterday had a lot of women in it. Uh, we do have a lot of explosive aggressive women. We also deal with premeditated violence, but that's really more of a social learned kind of thing than this. And so uh, these were all men just because of the medication. The medication's really teratogenic. It's, it uh, really affects the fees. It also reduces the effectiveness of birth control pills. And these women and men are so impulsive that it's difficult to get them to commit to using barrier contraception and things like that. So it's real expensive to the females. We have to, we've done a few. We have to get a pregnancy test on them continually throughout the study. So it's a lot more expensive. Well, actually, you can find just about any therapy. Right, and I think, I think the, th the thing is, is that even what you would think of, and, and I wouldn't clump those in the category of non-traditional. I would clump those in the kind of almost the category of quackery. Because, I mean, there's legitimate non-traditional therapies, and then there's kind of the fringe. And what you find is the fringe a lot of times will even work. And that, again, it's back to the expectancy. You, you, in essence, you know, to use a word I've heard a lot around here, you've kind of centered the person and that you said, you're going to get better and you're going to have control and you are going to be able to deal with this. And, and as long as that's maintained, as you can see from that one graph, they get better. But when they start to not be reinforced by their physiology, by their environment, by their behavior, they start to realize, well, I'm not. And so they kind of, again, separate and that's I'm losing control of my behavior. Well, we see, you know, we see that they are, they're, cortically, they're under-aroused. Uh, we see that on the EEGs, on the evoked event-related potentials. And um, they tend to have a lot of early sensory and attentional processing problems that we can see with the evoked potentials, which I think just, which is, comes from the arousal dysfunction, but just sets up all of the processing deficits that you see. Um, it's all related back to that. And I think that's why the anticonvulsants actually work, because, you know, they're, uh, sodium and calcium channel blockers, and they tend to work in these individuals the way they, they do they work in someone who has a seizure disorder. What happens is these guys are kind of under aroused, they can't really modulate their arousal well, and a stimulus comes in and they kind of just go off. You, know, you get this kind of almost seizure like uh, activation, and so these just kind of maintain that, keep it from getting out of control. And that is what I described them as that moment of thinking about what you're going to do. Because obviously from our, our self-report data, they have some kind of hostile attribution bias where they're just, that's just how I'm going to be. Um, and you know, it's just, it's okay for me to be that way because I lose control. That's where they justify it, I think he was first. I think that you know what you, within the classification scheme, which we deemed as a primary aggression, you have the impulsive and the premeditated, and obviously all of this has both a there clearly some biological aspect and clearly some social learned aspect. What we've suggested is that the impulsive aggressive individual has much more of a heavy biological load because we see this obvious abnormality and this dysfunction, and we can treat them with some pharmacotherapy. Um, but clearly there's a learned component of the cognitive behavior therapy and all this stuff wouldn't even be necessary. If I could just correct whatever imbalance, as they often say, it would be fine. 
On the other side, on the premeditated, none of these medications have ever been effective at all. And we, tend, we find no neuropsychological deficit, and we find no physiological deficit. Now, they have a massive personality problem, which in, a, in and of itself has some biological component also. But I would say that has a heavier learned kind of social component. But surely there's some biological. So I think it's a mix of both, but I think you know, I think we can talk about, you know, heavy load versus a lighter load. And we to dismiss either one. Um, and I, early on, we dismissed it a lot. We just thought, well, therapy, what, these guys are bad therapy candidates. They're not going to do well in there, so why do it? Well, I think with these big articles that were in American Journal, like I mentioned, I think that they, and, and the funding opportunities that are coming available, I really do think it's going to alter the way we analyze uh, drug efficiency. And I think that more likely or not, over time, and it's going to take time, you're going to want, you're going to see articles that talk about a psychological component and a physiological component, and not just it worked or it, it wasn't as good as the placebo, but you're going to see those, those uh, effects separated where the per, you will discuss a percentage of a psychological effect versus a physiological effect. You, you see what I'm saying? So then you, have, you, in essence, have a full description of the efficacy. I also think this all comes at an interesting time when, uh, you know, clinicians in the, uh, in the states are, you know, arguing over they want prescription privileges. Um, which I've always said really is just saying, well, everything we do is worthless. We just want to do what you do <laughs> to psychiatrists. I mean, you know, therapy is no good. We just have to have a pills. You know, we have to have the dust in our little bags that we can fix people with. Uh, I, I think psychology has a lot to add. And why would you want to abandon it? In sense? You know, and they may say, well, we just want to augment it. Well, be a specialist and expert in what you do. Don't worry about what someone else does. I mean, I, so I think that it's also going to be, it's going to play some role in that also. Because there are plenty of clinicians that are arguing what I say, just the opposite. I think my time is up, and I thank you for your time. I do have some, these are from yesterday's workshop. This is a classification scheme and an outline of, of some of the papers that we've used this stuff with, if you'd like one of those. Thank you very much.